from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Today. Coming up on Ag Day, two turkeys head to the White House and we're definitely not talking politics. Now you can have a say in who gets pardoned. China turning to Brazil for soybeans. Can the U.S. ever get that market back? And as the war of words escalates between the U.S. and China, but there has to be change. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest lasting full-size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. China's foreign ministry is blaming the U.S. for ruining the, quote, harmonious atmosphere at a meeting of world leaders in Papua New Guinea. It has highlighted the divisions between the U.S. and China and a growing competition for influence in the South Pacific. For the first time in its 29 years of summits, leaders at the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Meeting failed to agree on a joint statement over the weekend. The spokesperson for the Chinese government said the U.S. was, quote, in a blaze of anger at the meeting. He said comments made by Vice President Mike Pence were unhelpful for all parties to reach consensus. Pence and China's President Xi Jinping traded barbs and speeches, Pence accusing China of intellectual property theft, forced technology transfers, and unfair trading practices. All of those issues I know are going to be topics that the President uh, and President Xi discuss at the G20, but in our conversations, uh, I reiterated to him that, that the President and the people of the United States of America are interested in a better relationship with China, but there has to be change. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said there were differences between several nations at the summit, including China and the U.S. Draft versions of the statement that were seen by the Associated Press showed the U.S. wanted strong language against unfair trade practices. Meanwhile, President Trump saying he thinks a deal can be reached between the U.S. and China. The president vocal on how he wants China to commit to resuming imports of U.S. soybeans in an agreement. Betsy Gibbon joins us now with more. Betsy, there's a lot at risk at this G20. Absolutely. As the industry waits to see what a meeting between the president and his Chinese counterpart could mean at the G20 summit, Reuters reporting Brazil has shipped 80 million tons of soybeans to China this marketing year. It's a record amount and it's continuing to climb. Market analyst John Bays, who works with the U.S. Soybean Export Council, says 80 million tons is quite an increase compared to the roughly 50 million exported to China from the country last year. He thinks if a deal is made, the U.S. may not receive that market share back. If it were to be settled here, and say in the early, in say early December, uh, I think there would be probably seven, eight, ten million tons of soybeans flow out of the U.S. toward China before the Brazilian harvest really gets going. Uh, but we're never going to ship as many soybeans to China, in my opinion, as we did in the past, because importers are going to be nervous about uh, shipping to uh, uh, China, afraid that some like uh, some conflict like this may occur in the future. He says the United States is shipping beans across the world, but not at the same pace the U.S. would ship to China. Bay says the U.S. has shipped roughly 400,000 tons to China thus far in the marketing year. Last year, that was 10 million tons. All right, thanks, Betsy. Chinese-owned Smithfield terminating its trade aid package. Reuters reporting the $240,000 contract was terminated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture at the company's request. The action comes after some farm state lawmakers, such as Republican Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa, complained about Smithfield taking part in the aid program that was to benefit U.S. producers of pork and other ag commodities. The outbreak of African swine fever continues to spread through China, the country reporting two new cases. One case found in wild hogs, another in a small herd of 40, but in one of the top pork producing regions of the country, the Sichuan region produced almost 66 million pigs last year, more than any other province. ASF has now been found in every major pig producing region of China. In the U.S., there's already work underway to keep ASF out of the states. I'm joined now by Michael Nevue, an economist with American Farm Bureau. As we watch African swine fever develop in China, how bad is it really? Do we know, Michael? So far, uh, African swine fever has popped up in China with over 60 outbreaks in 18 different provinces. Uh, to date, there has been over 200,000 pigs culled. Now, with China, these numbers are widely suspected to be underreported, but at this stage, it's still a little bit too early to really say how bad it's going to be. So I guess what is China doing to stop it? One of the restrictions that China put in place is they ban the transport of hogs through provinces that 
are infected with African swine fever. So one thing that you've seen is where the pork is produced in the country and where the majority of the pork is consumed in the country, you're starting to see a really big price spread between those areas. China is the world's largest producer and consumer of pork. So if this turns out to be something as big as, let's say, 15% of China's herd, it's a good idea to remember that that's the size of the entire U.S. herd, just for a magnitude comparison. So at this point, what should producers here at home be doing? Well, at this point, it also wouldn't be a bad idea for producers to have a conversation with their veterinarian about reviewing their on-farm biosecurity plan. Uh, another way to prepare for this is the Pork Board website has a foreign animal disease checklist about what producers can be going through and making sure that their farm is prepared for anything to happen. Uh, additionally, at this point, uh, USDA is having wargaming exercises to essentially practice how they would respond to any kind of outbreak occurring in the U.S. as well. So the industry and the government and producers are all remaining vigilant on how to prevent this spread to the United States. All right, thanks, Michael. Now, we continue to track the latest on the Farm Bill. Washington Insider is telling us a draft Farm Bill conference report could be ready early this week. House Agriculture Ranking Member Democrat Colin Peterson of Minnesota said last week, quote, the goal is to finish this by Monday. There are reports House Agriculture Committee Chairman Michael Conaway has backed off on dramatic changes to the SNAP program installed in the $87 billion Farm Bill that could seal a deal with ranking Democrat Colin Peterson and send a version of the bill to the Senate. The Senate Agriculture Chairman Roberts also said the deal was close. Following a visit to those devastated by the wildfires in California, President Trump pledging $500 million in the Farm Bill for forest management. Fire officials say the Northern California wildfire that killed at least 77 people continues to burn in rugged terrain. The firefighters have managed to boost their containment of the blaze. The fire is now 66% contained. That fire has charred 236 square miles since it ignited earlier this month near Paradise, a town of 27,000 people. It's now leveled. 1,000 names remain on a list of people who have not been located. Finally, some good news about farm finances. Filings for Chapter 12 bankruptcy protection are down across farm country. That's despite expectations that the level would rise. Farm Bureau reports bankruptcy filings are down 8%. They are still about 25% higher than in 2014. And what did you think about the outcome of the midterm elections? A new Farm Journal Pulse survey shows most people were satisfied with the results. In fact, 64% of farmers who responded say they are very satisfied or somewhat satisfied with the outcome. Democrats won control of the U.S. House but lost seats in the Senate, with Republicans retaining control there. Well, progress moves forward. Not everyone is done, as meteorologist Cindy Clausen explains in today's Crop Comments. Thanks, Clinton. Well, snow is continuing to be an issue when it comes to the harvest. Check out this picture shared with us by Jason Smith. He titled it simply Snow Plowing, and you can see why. A tough day trying to bring in that harvest for sure. Let's take a look at our wind forecast as we head through the day today, and you'll see that in the northern plains heading into the upper Midwest uh, once again, like we've seen many of the days. And then in the overnight hours, we see that starting to pick up into the central and eastern Great Lakes, and that will continue on through Wednesday into the northeastern United States. It'll start getting breezy out in the western United States as we get into Wednesday as we start seeing some more active weather there. We'll talk more about your forecast coming up in just a bit, but first, here are some hometown temps. Keeping track of the shifting market prices has never been so easy. Get the latest commodity prices sent directly to your cell phone with market updates. Just text markets 8 to 31313 to get started. USDA recently adjusting world corn stocks. So does that change the outlook for prices here at home? We'll talk about it next at the agribusiness desk. And later, two turkeys that won't be on anyone's dinner table. Hear about the unique lives of peas and carrots coming up. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. 
Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. Here at the Agribusiness Desk, we have Sam Hudson, Corn Belt Marketing. Sam, let's talk about the recent USDA report came out and the, the global supply demand number, they changed stocks in China. Explain that for us and what do we take away from that huge number? Yeah, so China revised basically 10 years of production data and put the equivalent of the, the yearly production of Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana together uh, wow. back on the balance sheet. So, and unfortunately that mass, what was otherwise an actual a supportive report for corn. They did cut demand, uh, but the yield did drop a little bit more than expected, so the carryout dropped. And now the, the trade is having a little trouble deciphering how, how to digest that information. Uh, typically China's numbers are, are kind of written off anyways because they're not a major importer or exporter, at least of late. Um, but when you look at a number that large where you literally double it in just one stroke of the pen, it sort of puts a wet blanket on top of things. And on top of it, we're in the midst of a trade war. So you wonder if there's any political undertones in this, if we'll learn of that at some point here. Um, you hope they don't go to start exporting corn. I don't expect that. But uh, again, you know, when you know that supply is there, or at least the USDA right. is advertising that at face value, uh, it, it doesn't really shed a real positive light on things. You know, one of the things we've heard through the years is that China has m massive stockpiles. Sometimes we hear that the grain isn't very good quality. Mm -hmm. Do we know anything else about what's there and that not, what's making up that number? Not necessarily. I mean, and, and you, the thing you have to argue is if they were off this much over the last 10 years, how do we, you know, sit here and expect and trust that the number they're given now is, is <laughs> right. correct? You know, and, and I think part of the reason they're wanting to ramp up their ethanol in, in the future is to get rid of some of those extra stockpiles and, and kind of ramp sure. that up when they've got times of surplus. Um, and you know that's that would be very beneficial potentially for the world and world corn demand. But short term, uh, we've got you know prices that had rallied here a few years back enough to continue to expand acreage, not only in the U.S., but around the world. Mm. And if that continues and we continue to see good weather, we're going to sit here in, in a situation where we've got to have a supply problem um, to get our prices up, up and running again. If I'm a farmer in the U.S., real quick, what should I be thinking and doing because of this number? You know, I, I think you've got to take a look at your on-farm inventories, what you can store, what's being stored commercially. Uh, if you had your a, a big crop, it becomes more of a dollars per acre decision as opposed to a dollars per bushel. Mm -hmm. um, manage the basis as, as best you can. Again, we've seen values really come together here over the last few weeks as harvest comes to a close. Uh, and there's no guarantee of how much firmer they can get, especially when you look at you know the price of crude oil going down now and uh, and where biofuel margins will be. Yeah, so much goes into it. Appreciate the insight. Thank you so much, Sam. We'll Thank be you. back with more Ag Day here in just a minute. For marketing advice, call Sam Hudson with Corn Belt Marketing at 800-655-3380. You could win a Ford F-150 Raptor in the Ag Explore Truck Sweepstakes. Enter at trucksweeps.com. Welcome back to Ag Day. Meteorologist Cindy Clausen here looking at the weather map this week. And Cindy, from what I hear, it's going to be a little bit quieter for big parts of the country. Yeah, and a lot of folks will be thankful to have <laughs> a nice Thanksgiving because we have high pressure that's going to be over a lot of the middle part of the country. Let's take a look. For now, the high pressure will be over, especially the central and southern plains and out into the west, where we still see some wet weather from this low pressure system that will be moving off the east coast. So look for still some rain and even some snow on the back side of that. Some showers and thunderstorms possible in parts of the southeast. We will have a weak system that comes through into the upper Midwest and eventually into the Great Lakes as we get into this afternoon and on to tonight. The low pressure system moves off of the east coast. Look at that high pressure starting to move to the east. We're going to see fairly dry weather in a lot of the country. Once we get this low pressure system off into the east, a lot of us are going to be seeing dry weather for Thanksgiving as well as everything moves off to the east and the front. Really, the moisture is more so near the low. There's really not much along the front. Now watch out west. We have some rain that's going to be moving into the west coast. And it's not just a single rainfall. We're going to be looking at uh, some periods of potentially heavy rainfall that could be good for helping with the fires, not so much with the recovery effort. As we head through the day on Wednesday, you can see that low continues to move on off towards New England and eventually off the coast. But we have a lot of high pressure in the nation's midsection as we get into Wednesday. This is 7 p.m. Wednesday, and it looks about the same for Thursday as well. But we do expect to see a wet 
period for much of the West Coast. Here's a look at your precipitation estimate. The past 24 hours, it hasn't been a ton, but it's mainly been along that first front over in parts of the Gulf Coast states and on up into the northeast and adding the next 24 hours to that. You can see that's where the focus is going to be until the rain starts coming into the Pacific Northwest and along the West Coast. As far as snowfall, it's mainly on the backside of that low pressure system in the northeastern United States because we've been a little bit warmer out in the West. Here's a look at our temperatures and yeah, we still have that chill in much of the eastern part of the country. It's been a little bit warmer in the Plain States, but we're going to see a bit of a cool down as we get into the next 24 hours. L temperatures getting down to only 11 in Sault Ste. Marie, a lot of 20s and 30s across the central parts of the country and into tomorrow we go. We still have a lot of 30s and 40s there. Look at that a high of only 12 degrees tomorrow, so some very bitter cold, especially up by the Great Lakes. Taking a look at the jet stream, we still have that trough in the northeastern part of the country still a ridge in the west. We've been seeing the warmer weather there. We're going to see that trough slowly pulling away and then a ridge moves through, but then it flattens out and another trough comes in later for the weekend for a lot of the north central United States and eventually into the northeast as we get into the early part of next week. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check on the weather where you live. Powder River, Wyoming, sunny and breezy for you today with, and a little bit warmer with a high of 43 degrees. Mountain View, Missouri, lots of sunshine with a high of 42. And Brandon, Vermont, snow showers with a high of 33. We have fresh milk production numbers from USDA. We'll take a look at that next in our dairy report. And later, a little holiday justice for two Washington turkeys. Details in the country. Ag Day, brought to you by Corvus Corn Herbicide from Bayer. Get an early season win against weeds with Corvus for end of season rewards. In our dairy report, the latest milk production estimates are out from USDA. As farmers, one thing we have always done well is become more efficient. So each year, Duane and I look at our farm and we say, how can we become more efficient? That is the mentality of farmers, is they want to become better. And so um, if that's the mentality and that's the way farmers are going to continue to farm, then we need to figure out how we are going to innovate and move more product. The Food and Drug Administration is expanding its comment period for plant-based milk labels. Yet again, the FDA asking for input, whether to allow labels of plant-based milk, yogurt, or cheese to be labeled as milk. This time, the FDA is extending its deadline to January 25th. The National Milk Producers Federation says it's going to take the extension and explain to the FDA why they feel plant-based milk shouldn't have the same label. We have a lot of data already that shows that people don't always know that an almond beverage or a soy drink does not have the same amount of vitamins and minerals and protein as real milk. And they may just think that because it looks like milk, it's packaged like milk, it's sold in the dairy case, that it's six of one, half a dozen of another. Not all milks are created equal, however. We're talking turkeys in Washington next. Of course, it's the gobble kind. Uh, presidential pardons up for grabs. Details after the break. Ag Day, brought to you by the Enlist Weed Control System. More weed control, less drift and volatility, maximum yield potential. In the Country, brought to you by Kubota. Check out Kubota's RTVX 1140, a rugged utility vehicle with seating for four. Stop by your local dealer today or visit Kubota.com. A big day for a couple of turkeys at the White House today. They will be pardoned by the president. This year's birds are named peas and carrots. Now, peas is described on the White House website as loving to snack on popcorn and watch planes fly overhead. Apparently, peas also loves to listen to Brad Paisley and has a gobble style described as boisterous. Carrots, on the other hand, loves to listen to Elvis, snack on M&Ms, and does yoga. This year, 
you get to decide which one gets the official pardon. Now to vote, you can check out Ag Day's Twitter page. No matter who you vote for, after they are pardoned, both will live at Virginia Tech's Gobbler's Rest exhibit. Good luck to our feathered friends. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.